Let's pray as you prepare to hear from Jesus today. Jesus, we do want to hear your voice. Speak to us through your words. Speak to us through your actions. Speak to each individual what they need to hear, what they need to know, and what they need to do to experience your presence, to know you better, to live more confidently and boldly in their faith. In your name, amen. Because Jesus is not dead, you can live the not life. And if you missed last week's message or the week before in this not life message series, you ought to listen to them. You can do so at hollychurch.org. These not commands that Jesus gives when he's first teaching them, they seem like they're really not doable. And it's only in the light of Jesus' resurrection from death do these commands make any sense. It's because of Jesus' resurrection from death to life that we can live the not life. And Jesus gives us these not life commands because he wants us to live the best life. Last week, I talked about Jesus' command, fear not. I do not have to be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of. And we said that out loud together last week. I think it'd be a great idea to do so again this week. So wherever you are, I don't have to be afraid even when there's something to be afraid of. Isn't that awesome? It's a great way to live. And today's not command comes from a story that many of you have probably heard before. And in fact, when I begin, you're going to want to just jump right to the end of this story, but try to pull back from doing that so you can experience the very real tr tension, the very real drama of this story, especially in light of where this story takes place. The setting is in the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of Judea, and the, store, and the city in which the temple dedicated to the one true God is located. Before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, God's presence on earth, uh, that temple, <laughs> represents God's presence here on earth. Christians, now after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we represent God here on earth. We are the temple of God, both individually and collectively. But when Jesus was here on earth, a physical temple still represented his presence. The temple is where every true follower of Yahweh, that's God's personal name, it, it's where every true follower of Yahweh, the God of Israel, came to worship at at least once a year at this temple. And King Solomon, and you can read about him building this temple in the Old Testament portion of your Bible, the, the part written before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and King Solomon builds the first temple dedicated to Yahweh. But God's people, the Israelites, God's people, can, their continual sin brings about God's judgment. And Solomon's temple is completely destroyed by the Babylonians when they come in and they overtake the country of Judah and take many people into captivity. Now, the other tribes... <laughs> Now, that was just Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes, they are already gone because the Assyrians, because of their sin, the Assyrians have already come through and wiped them out and dispersed them westward. Now, eventually, though, God allows a, a small remnant of faithful Israelites to return to Jerusalem, and they're to rebuild the city, and they're to rebuild the temple. Well, they do a pretty good job of rebuilding the city and starting up their businesses again and rebuilding their homes, but when it comes to God's temple, not so much. They don't hardly do any work on it at all. They lose focus on that because they're focusing so much on themselves instead of on the Lord. And it's something God's people, you and I, we're still prone to do that today, to focus on our own homes, to focus on our own plans, to focus on our own stuff and kind of, hey, Jesus, you can take a back seat. It's not the way it should be, but it is, it's the way it often is. And it was no different then. So God's temple never gets rebuilt, at least not yet. Now, eventually, Judea and Galilee, they become part of the Roman Empire. And Herod the Great, who is very loyal to Rome, he's helped out Rome, he is commissioned, he's declared to be the king of the Jews 
by the Roman Empire, and he rules under their authority over Judea and Galilee. The most well-known thing about Herod the Great that you probably have heard about is that he tries to kill Jesus right after he's born in Bethlehem. Now, Herod is a Jew himself, not a very faithful one, but he decides, he, he loves building projects. So he decides that he's going to rebuild the temple dedicated to the God of Israel. Still not rebuilt, even now. Many years have gone by. But he decides it's going to get done, and he's going to do it bigger and grander. It's going to be greater than Solomon's temple, even. Now, Herod the Great has many flaws, uh, one of them being his great lack of humility. See what I did there? Great lack of humility. But he does complete the rebuilding of the temple dedicated to the worship of the God of Israel. And it is bigger and grander than Solomon's temple. The temple grounds cover 30 acres of land. And this picture gives you sort of an idea of the massiveness of the temple grounds. But I think it's one of those things you'd really have to see in person to understand what a grand structure it was. The large area you see within the outer walls that surrounds that building structure in the middle, that's the court of the Gentiles. And this is where anyone could come to worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. However, you had to be Jewish to step into that area that's in the middle. Here's more of a bird's eye view of the temple area. If you were a Jew, you could leave the court of the Gentiles by going through the beautiful gate, and that would then you would find yourself in the woman's court. And even though it's called the woman's court, men, women, and kids could all be in this area. Around the walls of the women's court are 13 trumpet-shaped containers, and they didn't pass offering baskets, or people didn't give online there, <laughs> then, and, then and there. But you would give by dropping your offering, your ties, into those trumpet-shaped containers. And once you were in the women's court, you could see another gate, the Nic <laughs> Nicanor Gate, and only male Jews can go through this gate, which opens up into the court of Israel, which leads to the priest's court, where the altar of burnt offering is. Animals would be sacrificed here for God's sin, or for the sins of God's people. Beyond that is the Holy of Holies, where God's presence resides, and only the high priest of Israel could enter into the Holy of Holies, and he could only do that one time a year. As you can see from the pictures, there's more than one entrance into the temple grounds, but most Jews would enter in by the southern stairs, especially when you were coming to the temple to offer a sacrifice for your sins. You came up the southern stairs. The southern stairs are the ones at the bottom of the picture, and the southern wall was about 900 feet in length, and some of the southern stairs survived the Roman Empire's destruction of the temple, and here's a modern-day picture of them. In Jesus' day, these stairs would have taken up about 240 feet. They were 240 feet in length, and they are slightly larger than normal steps. And if you were bringing an animal with you to sacrifice, you would bring them up these stairs, or you could purchase an animal for sacrifice. You entered in through that gate, and right to your left, as you entered in by those southern stairs, you could purchase an animal for sacrifice. These stairs are significant in the story we're looking at today because everyone in this story would have walked up those stairs to make a sacrifice for their sins. Everyone except for Jesus, because he never sinned. Now, sin is knowingly or unknowingly breaking any of God's commands. It's only because Jesus never sins that he's able to die for your sins. And not just for your sins, but for my sin, for our sin, for the sins of all eternity, from the beginning of time to the end of time, as we know it. And only God's blood could be valuable enough to do that. Now, before Jesus' death on a cross, animals would have to be sacrificed in your place for your sin. And I know, gruesome. But that is how 
serious God takes your sin, my sin. Now, these animal sacrifices, however, did not get rid of your sin. They, they just kind of rolled your sin ahead year by year. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 through 4. But the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It only reminds people of their sins from one year to the next. Those animal sacrifices were just a temporary solution that only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection could solve entirely and completely. One day, Jesus walks up those southern stairs. John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn, he went to the temple complex again, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began to teach them. So Jesus is in the court of Gentiles, and all these people are gathered around him, and he's teaching them. And the Pharisees and scribes, you can't miss them. They're dressed really fancy. They're, they're the religious leaders. They're experts in matters of religion. And they gather just outside this circle of people that are listening to Jesus teach, and they whisper excitedly to one another. This is the moment they've been waiting for. Some of them rush down the southern stairs to get the woman. What woman? And why, why do they want her there? Well, we aren't told her name, but she is a woman who has been caught in the act of adultery. They drag her up those southern stairs. The crowds part for these important men, and they bring this woman, and they stand her right in front of Jesus. The Pharisees and the scribes, are, they're giddy with excitement as more and more people come. To, to see what's happening, because this is the spectacle. They want this to be a public spectacle. It's what they've been waiting for. And they don't care about the woman. And what about her? You know, is she crying? Is she mortified? Is she defiant? Is she defeated? We aren't told. But we can surmise that she would have rather been almost anywhere else than standing there in the middle of this crowd of people while the Pharisees and scribes shout out her sin. John chapter 8, verse 4, teacher. These guys are pretending to admire Jesus. They don't admire him at all, but they're pretending to. Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. This isn't a rumor. The case is ironclad against her. She has been seized in the very act of adulterating God's design for male-female relationships. She has been caught in the very act of adulterating the purpose for sex, which is to bond two people, a man and a woman, together. And God's law, God's command is quite clear. Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. The religious leaders say to Jesus, John chapter 8, verse 5, now in the law, like Jesus wouldn't know what the law says. Like Jesus wouldn't understand the law of God. They're needling him. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to discredit him in front of the Jewish uh, people, in front of this huge crowd of people, Jews who all very well know what the law of God says. And these religious leaders, they very well know that Jesus knows what it says as well. But they're trying to get under his skin. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone, put to death by throwing stones at someone. Such women, what then do you say? Can you feel the drama of the story here? Can you feel the tension? Sense it. Jesus versus his greatest enemies while the woman stands there knowing she has sinned. Uh, you know, some in our culture don't think twice about sin. They sin and they don't care one bit that they do so. But this woman is a Jew. So she's walked up these southern stairs before to offer sacrifices for her sin. She has probably resigned herself that she is going to die right here in her sin before God and everyone. Jesus has been challenged by these scribes and Pharisees, what will he do? The crowd is silent. The Pharisees and scribes, at least for the moment, are silent. 
Jesus is silent? Is he mulling over how he should respond to them? Jesus could respond, well, if she's guilty, what did you bring her here for? If you know the law of Moses says to stone her, why haven't you stoned her? Could have said that. Or if Jesus was feeling particularly feisty, uh, he might have said, if you know the law of God so well, where's the man? Where's the other person? Because the law of God says, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. But Jesus doesn't say anything. And the religious leaders are perhaps thinking, finally, we've got him. We've been trying to trap him in something for, for years now, and we finally got him because we can declare he's a false teacher if he doesn't side with the law of God and tells us to, to not stone this woman to death. And then we'll win back the allegiance of these people who are following him, who really should be following us. We should have their allegiance. They're waiting. They're anticipating his response. But instead, Jesus kneels down, and he begins writing in the dust. Finally, the religious leaders can't stand it. He's just writing in the dirt. He's not saying anything, so they just keep pressuring him and pressuring him over and over again for an answer. Jesus stands up and says, John chapter 8, verse 7, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, the reality of where they're standing may be beginning to dawn on them as Jesus speaks this, those words to them. You see, every single one of them has walked up those southern stairs into the temple to make a sacrifice for their sins. This place where they're standing, it reminds them of their own personal sins, their own personal failures. It's the place they've come to their entire lives from the time they were young men to make sacrifices for their sin in order to stay in good standing with God. He who is without sin, cast the first stone. And there is one standing there who could cast the first stone and the second one and the third one until that woman is dead. But he's not holding any stones to throw. Instead, he kneels back down and he begins to write in the dirt some more. And as silence hangs in the air, the woman's accusers begin to leave one by one. They go out of the temple, down those southern stairs, beginning with the oldest accusers first. Beginning with the ones who have walked those stairs the most to offer sacrifices for their sins. Perhaps now, walking down those stairs, they recall how unworthy they are. Perhaps some even consider how they deserve to be stoned for their sin. Now, over the years, uh, lots of people have speculated about what Jesus was writing in the dirt. And my wife, Jennifer, she likes to know all the details. And so she thinks it may have been this. It, it takes one to know one. You never know. Jennifer could be right. We aren't told what Jesus is writing, but we are told what happens next. Jesus stands up, looks at the woman, and asks, John chapter 8, verse 10, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? Now, Jesus isn't saying she's not guilty because she is guilty. She's not innocent. She should pay the price for her sin, which is death. However, today, she's being shown mercy. And grace. John chapter 8, verse 11, and she said, No one, sir. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. From now on, sin no more. Now, other than relief, I don't know if that woman thought about those words that much, sin no more, but, you know, as I think about them, it's like, Really, Jesus? Sin not? What motivates Jesus? to give us such a command, such a, 
a not life command. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way before, but every sin comes prepackaged with a penalty. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And every time you sin, something dies because sin kills. Over time, sin will kill your conscience. You know that. There are things that used to bother you, but they don't bother you anymore, even though there's something inside of you that tells you this should bother you. Sin will ultimately kill your mind. It destroys the ability to think clearly. Sin will ultimately kill your body. It kills self-respect. It kills relationships. It's, for some of you, it's killed a family. It's killed a marriage. It's killed a relationship that you should have with your mom or dad. It's destroyed a relationship, killed a relationship that you should have with one of your kids or one of your siblings. Sin kills your self-control. Sin has the power to kill an entire culture. Sin kills. And you know that. Kills your conscience, kills all those things. And its penalty is death. And so Jesus tells this woman, tells us, from now on, sin no more, sin not. Why is Jesus saying this? His motivation is love. You know, if you would, just, if you would obey this command, this not life command, how much better your life would be and how much better everyone else's life around you would be. Jesus says, I don't need to condemn you because your sin already does that. I don't need to punish you right now because your sin already does that. In the case of the woman caught in adultery, at the very least, sin has killed a reputation. It's probably killed one or two marriages and perhaps some other relationships as well. Her sin, your sin, kills. So out of compassion, Jesus urges us to sin not. When you sin, you break God's heart because he knows sin will eventually break you. This is why Jesus urges you to go and sin no more. This sin not command of Jesus is a command of mercy. It's a command of grace. It's offered to every man, to every woman, to every child. It's a, you know, admit their sin and ask for forgiveness. And what is your sin? What is it that you know you need to walk away from and sin no more? Not because God's out to get you, we don't see that in the story here. But because sin will eventually kill you. What is your sin, the one you deserve to be condemned to death for? Here's the heart of God towards you. Jesus says, I don't condemn you. Your sin already does that. Go and sin no more. I know what you're thinking because I've been a sinner myself for a while. It's not that easy. Just go and sin no more. Of course it's not that easy because that's the nature of sin. It entraps you. It ensnares you. Jesus says, do not sin because he knows. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus says, do not sin because he knows it's such an easy trap to fall into. It's easy to fall into the trap of sin. It's not so easy to get out of it. So it's not going to be easy to walk away. But Jesus says, you can and he'll help you do so. He'll help you get out of the trap of your sin. So what's your sin? Whatever it is, it is killing you. And your Savior is urging you to leave it at his cross. Because Romans 6.23, here's the rest of the story. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Why not decide right now, I'm not going back. I'm not going back to him. I'm not going back to her. I'm not going back to it. I'm not going back there. I'm not going back to lying. I'm not going back to cheating. I'm not going back to stealing. I'm not going back to anger. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to pray for you. Jesus, every single one of us can relate to this woman in the story because we all sin. And I thank you for the mercy and grace 
that you offer not only to her, but to each one of us. Jesus, may we hear your voice above sin's accusations and above sin's pull at our lives. Jesus, give us supernatural strength and courage to walk away from sin and the destruction and death it brings to us and to those around us. In your name I pray these things. And keeping our heads bowed and eyes closed, perhaps you've never received Jesus into your life. You can do so right now. Please pray these words silently as I pray them out loud. These are really good words for all of us to pray. Jesus, I am a sinner. I deserve to be condemned and punished. Thank you for taking the punishment of sin upon yourself that I deserve. I deserve the punishment, but you took it. Jesus, you are Lord. Forgive me. I want to follow you completely from this moment forward. Amen. If you did make a first-time decision today to follow Jesus, please let us know that on your connection card because we'd love to help you in your spiritual journey. You'll find your connection card link if you're in the description if you're on Facebook or YouTube. If you're at Holly Church Online, just click the button right below this video.